Grace to you and peace from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Welcome to worship today. It is wonderful to see so many of you here. I invite you to join me in our call to worship, which is on the screen. Come and celebrate, people of God. For our God comes to us. He comes bringing peace, offering hope and love to all who despair. Our opening hymn this morning is When Morning Gilds the Skies, number 438, if you'd like to use your hymn books. Please be seated. Please join me in prayer. <clears throat> Loving and wondrous God, you come to us when we least expect it, calling us out of our routines and our plans, inviting us to follow Jesus into new opportunities. We praise you for the many ways you come to us. In moments of fear, you speak with words of reassurance. In moments of doubt, you reach out your hand to hold. In moments of turmoil, you bring calm to the storm. You are faithful to us through everything life can bring. And so we place our trust in you this day and every day and honor you as our Redeemer and Savior. Merciful and patient God, we confess that even though you reach out to us with saving grace, we still experience fear and doubt. You call us to live with courage and perseverance, yet we can give up too easily and opt for the safer route. You encourage us to be bold in our struggles for justice, yet we remain silent in the face of unfairness. Forgive us all the times we let you down. We confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. In your mercy, forgive what we have been. Help us to amend what we are and direct what we shall be 
so that we may do justly, love mercy, and walk humbly with you, our God. Make us aware, O God, through your Spirit, that you are here among us. May this awareness lead us to approach this time more carefully. The words we speak, the music we appreciate, the, th the thoughts we think, the emotions we feel, may these be pleasing to you. We worship you, Lord, not because you need it, but because we do, because we long for your presence, because we are awed by your power and your compassionate care for us, because we know ourselves to be imperfect, and yet we are perfectly loved. May our worship be complete, whole, full to overflowing. O oh God, our rock and our redeemer, in Christ we pray. Amen. Sisters and brothers in Christ, take comfort in the assurance that even those things that are hidden from our memories or are too deep for our words are not beyond God's forgiving love. God has the power to heal our oldest pains, to lift our heaviest burdens, and to love us, even if we struggle to love ourselves. God knows us completely, and he forgives us completely, too. And may the peace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. The reading this morning is from Matthew's Gospel, chapter 13, verses 1 to 9. That same day Jesus went out of the house and sat beside the sea. Such great crowds gathered around him that he got into a boat and sat there, while the whole crowd stood on the beach. And he told them many things in parables, saying, Listen, a sower went out to sow. And as he sowed, some fell on a path, and the birds came and ate them up. Other seeds fell on rocky ground, where they did not have much soil. They sprang up quickly, since they had no depth of soil. But when the sun rose, they were scorched, and since they had no root, they withered away. Other seeds fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked them. Other seeds fell on soil and brought forth grain, some hundredfold, some sixty, and some thirty. If you have ears, hear. Thank you, Noel. So this parable is, is a pretty familiar one if you've been hanging around churches for, for any length of time at all. It's also a popular image just generally for Christians, for evangelism and for spreading the good news. I think, the, I think it's the Canadian Bible Society that actually has as their logo. And it's a, a reference to this parable. I will let you know a little bit of sort of a minister's secret. The whole of Matthew chapter 13 is an absolute gift if you have to preach because it's good for the summer season. It's got all sorts of nice parables about the kingdom of God with nice imagery and, and good metaphors. We've touched on a few of these uh, over the past few weeks, the wheat and the weeds, uh, the mustard seed and the yeast, the hidden treasure and the pearl without price. And better still, and this is the really sneaky bit, Jesus explains what all of these parables mean for the most part, identifying who is who and what means what. It makes my job a whole lot easier. But in the face of, of so many strong and familiar images and about the kingdom and about the good news, it's easy to forget that, that Jesus taught into a particular historical moment using these parables. If you read more widely in the Gospel of Matthew, you will see that Jesus was not just sort of teaching for the sake of enlightening his listeners. He was teaching in response to a lot of publicly expressed sort of opposition and misunderstanding of his message. And his message, of course, if you'll recall, was, was just that the kingdom of God is near. Matthew chapter 11 and 12, leading up to this parable, show us how much people really, really struggled with it and even rejected Jesus' good news message. And then at the end of Matthew chapter 13, Jesus is rejected by his own family and his own community in his own place of worship at Nazareth. So the parables in between 
are great as standalone parables, but they may also kind of be an answer to the question that, that must have been on the minds of Jesus' friends and followers. Why does the gospel find hospitable space to grow in some people, but not in others? Why do some people reject it and oppose it, where others are just completely transformed? Now, I have heard this passage of scripture preached many times over the years, including while I was worshiping at church elsewhere on my vacation just last month. And many of those sermons have been excellent. Frequently, they have focused on the, the soils aspect of the story, and sometimes, so less often, on the sower who sows the seeds of the kingdom. And if you are, have a Bible, you don't need to look at it now, but if you have a Bible at home, you will probably see that it's parables given a title in the Bible, like a subheading within the chapter. In some of my Bibles, it's the parable of the sower. In other times, it's the parable of the soils. I suppose it could also be called the parable of the hundredfold harvest, although I haven't seen that one yet. But I guess the point that I got hung up on this week was that this parable is so often the parable of the sower or the parable of the seeds, or the parable of the soils, or the parable of the harvest, when really it's a parable about all of those things. But we'll start with the soils. So Jesus describes four soil types and what happens when the sower sows his seeds upon them. Now later on in Matthew chapter 13, Jesus actually explains more about these soils and how they are images of the human heart and mind, of how, of how we might respond when we hear the good news. And for some of us, our hearts are hardened so much that it's like soil that is compacted and solid, like a path. The seed just sort of sits on the surface and there's, there's no cracks through which the soil, in the soil that it could sort of trickle down and take root. Those of us who are like this kind of soil might hear the words of hope and love that the kingdom of God is near, but we don't want them. We don't want to understand them. We don't want the seeds to, to challenge or nurture or heal our hard-packed hearts, and we stay that way. Some of us have hearts like rocky soil. We might also imagine this as progress from being hard-packed and impenetrable to kind of broken up a bit, like, like the edge of a road where you get breaks in the pavement. The sower's seed hits and, and penetrates into the spaces between our hard places, and we get a little bit of sprouting. But the patterns of a hard heart are difficult to break. We want the good news, but we haven't learned yet that the promise of the good news does not make for a smooth and easy road. We want a quick sprout, but we don't want to do the work of cultivating and nourishing its presence. We don't let it root too deeply in us. We don't let it change us or challenge our views or our lifestyle or our ways of loving or worshiping. And when things get hard, we lose our little sprout of good news because we were too rocky to let it root very deep. The soil with thorns, Jesus explains, is those of us who welcome the seed but don't remove the other plants growing in our hearts so that the kingdom has room to flourish within us. We hang on to our fears and our worries, our harmful desires for, for more money or to be more important, our hurtful beliefs and our actions, and we refuse to pull those things up, those things that are rooted much more deeply in us than God. And so the gospel seedling is choked out, untended, and overwhelmed. And the good soil, of course, is the heart in which the conditions are wonderfully just right, and the gospel takes root and grows with ease, well-tended and well-nourished. It is always, I think, worth considering our personal soil type. Soil can't plow itself up to break up the hard bits or weed itself, but human hearts certainly can. Farmers back in Jesus' day used to broadcast... I'm, there you go. They used to broadcast their seeds by hand to sow them, and it is just that kind of emotion. They scattered them on the surface, and then they would go through and plow everything down afterwards. There is nothing wrong with that. It works just fine for the most part. Many farmers today still use sort of a, a mechanized version of the same concept of scattering seed to sow out, but the difference is that modern farmers work up the soil first. They use a variety of farm equipment to get a nice level, even field with lots and lots of open soil. 
If your field is rocky, you pick the rock out of it. If there are hard-packed areas, you make sure to plow through them. If there are weeds, you plow them down so they die. And I think we can do a bit of that work for ourselves in our own hearts with Jesus' help. We can want the good news to grow its crop of hope and justice and love in us, and we can commit to that growth, acting intentionally to tend our crop. And regular re of the good news through prayer or worship or devotional reading or Bible study, just to catch any bare spots, that's always going to be a good idea. But the sower in Jesus' parable sows his seed without knowing what lies beneath the surface. It's a good thing that this sower also seems to have a bottomless bag of seeds so he can sow as thoroughly and widely as he likes, hoping that it will take. But it's no surprise when you just sort of do that with your seed that some of it will fall on weedy or hard-packed or rocky ground. This style of sharing the good news message, it flies in the face of popular church wisdom today about how to reach people and how to help them hear what Jesus has to say. These days, the advice is to do your background work, to figure out your target audience and tailor a communication strategy to make sure that they can hear. Not this sower, though. He just broadcasts his seed in every direction, flinging it over the whole field, doing no preparation work whatsoever beyond just picking up his bag of endless seed and getting to work. Now, Jesus did a really thorough job of explaining the soils in relation to human hearts. And that's in verses 18 to 23 of Matthew 13, if you want to read it yourself later. Like some of the other parables, though, this explanation was delivered not to the crowd at large who heard the whole parable, but just to the disciples. It's curious, though, that Jesus didn't say anything about the sower. And that leads us to think that, I mean, who might this good sower be? Who is it meant to represent? Is the sower Jesus himself or, or God? Probably. But I wonder if Jesus focused on explaining about the soils to his disciples, because that's information that those who will be sowing need to know. I wonder if Jesus intended the disciples to see themselves as sowers of the kingdom, of sowers of that good news seed, too. Because sowing the way that the good sower does, it's not an easy thing. And if we are followers of Jesus, then it's what we are called to do, just as the disciples were. And that lesson about soils and human hearts becomes very personal as we seek to sow the seeds of the kingdom among those whom we know. When we sow out and it lands on good soil, it's a joyful task, watching the, the good news take root in someone's life and seeing it grow and bear a harvest for them. But it's also our calling to sow the seed and bear the heartache when it falls on rocky or hard-packed or thorn-infested ground. And that's the hard truth of this parable for Jesus' disciples and for followers of Jesus and for you and me. The parent or grandparent whose words of guidance and compassion fall on their teenager's deaf ears knows all about hard-packed ground. The business owner who produces a quality product and pays his employees a living wage only to see his customers go where things are cheaper is well acquainted with shallow roots. And the family member or friend who watches a loved one aggressively pursue their career or, or blow through their money or make bad decisions to the, the detriment of all else in their life knows very well the choking, destructive capacity of thorns. The good sower, though, teaches us how to deal with these less than optimal soils. Keep sowing. Keep scattering the seeds of the kingdom everywhere, into every relationship, into every chance encounter, into every conversation. Focus on sowing those seeds. It is very tempting to spend our resources, our, our time and our energy and our hope and our prayers trying to coax growth from inhospitable places and people, becoming more and more discouraged and more heartbroken when our hard work seems to fail and the good news just never seems to take root. 
But the sower does not do that. He accepts that some seed, maybe even a good portion of it, is going to fall on bad soil, and he keeps sowing. And the rest of the Gospel of Matthew demonstrates that this is exactly what Jesus did. He kept spreading the word, no matter how dry or rocky or weedy the ground, and his followers are called to do the same. But like Jesus, we also have another calling, and it's found in this parable too. Now, the story does not end with inhospitable soils, although many sermons that I've heard preached on this passage do. And it doesn't end with an, an endlessly sowing sower of the good news of the kingdom, persisting with his bottomless bag of seed and an untiring arm, just broadcasting the seed of the good news wherever he goes. This parable does not even end with a, a normal harvest from the good soil. It ends with a miracle, a hundredfold harvest. And it's our calling to trust and to proclaim that miraculous outcome, too. And I think the ending of this parable is actually the most challenging part of it, the hardest part to really believe in and to live into. Because Jesus goes beyond simply encouraging us to, to keep on keeping on in the face of rejection, of continuing to sow in spite of a poor catch of seed in a particular heart. Instead, this parable challenges us to believe in God's abundance no matter what, and to focus on that. Now, if the parable ended with a, a sevenfold harvest from the good soil, that would be great. Sevenfold yield on your seeding, that is a reasonable and a sufficient harvest. <clears throat> and it would make for just a good story, a practical story of encouragement and hope. But this parable is not reasonable or practical. It's not about managing our expectations. It is filled with promise, a promise that we are called to proclaim, even in the face of rejection in our own witnessing and in the realities of the world. A 30-fold harvest is abundant. That is a huge harvest. A 60-fold harvest could have fed a whole village for a year back then. A 100-fold harvest is the, the kind of crop yield that you can retire on. That is the kind of harvest that Jesus is promising us. There's a novelist named B.B. Moore Campbell who wrote that some of us have an empty barrel faith walking around expecting things to run out, expecting that there isn't enough air or enough water, expecting that something is going to go wrong. The God I serve told me to expect the best and that there is enough for everybody. This parable, above all else, reminds us that we are called to a faith of abundance, a, a full barrel, hundredfold harvest kind of faith. That is the reality of the kingdom of God that's near enough for us to trip over. The good news that we are meant to sow widely and to proclaim. And when I read this parable, for me, it paints a picture of a farmer who keeps happily going about sowing out her unending bag of seed because the more the kingdom takes root in the world, the better it'll be for everyone and the nearer the kingdom will get to every heart. So hopefully each kind of the different soil with every time the seed of the good news gets sown on it, hopefully each soil, each heart, is impacted, whether in a big way or a small way, until it becomes a good soil or returns to being a good soil, yielding a better harvest from season to season. Because the good soil represents when we hear the good news and we understand. Now, the Greek word for understand that the gospel writer uses carries with it a kind of understanding that's a bit different than how we think about it. I mean, I might understand how to make a vinaigrette, but this kind of understanding means to have a grasp of something that challenges how you think or what you do. In other words, in the Bible, to understand means that you understand something and it changes the way you act and the way you think. So when Jesus says that the good soil is a heart that hears and understands, he's referring to when we let the good news sink in deep enough and take hold of our hearts in such a way that it actually changes our lives. 
And maybe for some of us that does happen all in one go, one, one sowing of the seed. And maybe that takes many growing seasons and failed crops before we get a good catch. It doesn't matter, according to this parable. As followers of Jesus, we are meant to keep sowing and to focus on that task. Time and God's Spirit will do the rest. So that's the parable of the soils and the sower and the harvest. And many of Jesus' parables are like object lessons. They're sort of short and very to the point. And some of them are, are longer, more elaborate teaching stories. Now, this parable kind of sounds like an object lesson, but I think there's a little bit more to it. This particular parable of Jesus, it also describes his ministry. During his life, the seed of his teaching fell on rocky and hard-packed and thorny ground, as well as the occasional patch of good soil. In the months leading up to this particular teaching moment, Jesus' disciples lost faith during a storm at sea. The Jewish religious leaders made a concerted effort to choke out his message. Soon, Jesus will experience the hard, resistant soil of his hometown as the people of Nazareth reject him. Jesus did not just tell this parable, he lived it. And so did the community of Christians that Matthew wrote his gospel for, as they coped with poverty and persecution, people moving away in droves, internal conflict within their churches, and false teachers trying to distort, distort the simplicity of the good news that the kingdom of God really is near. We live this parable today too. And it reminds us that the rejection of Jesus' message doesn't mean that the message is wrong or that our efforts are a waste of time. It is simply a fact of life, whether in farming or in faith. Sometimes you get a good catch of what you've planted, and sometimes you don't. But that doesn't mean you don't try again next time. Jesus knows, and we know, the hard ways of the world. But Jesus also knows the abundant ways of God. May we have faith in God's abundant ways, too, and keep sowing and growing for him. Thanks be to God. Amen. For our prayer of thanksgiving and intercession, the response is on the screen. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Let us pray. Holy and steadfast God, we thank you and praise you for your abundant love shown to us in answered prayers, in promises kept, in the witness of scripture, in your faithfulness to us, and in our faith in you, a gift that is unearned, undeserved, given freely, and with great love. We thank you for the purpose and direction you give to us, for the ways that faith shapes our lives and allows us to share your blessings with our neighbors. For all this and so much more, we thank you and praise you today. Through Jesus, you promise to hear us when we pray in his name. Confident in your love and mercy, we offer our prayers for the world and for the people we care about. Lord, in your mercy. Heavenly Father, we pray for our local community and its needs. We pray for all those who live and work here, for any who are struggling at this time, for all those who are looking for work, for those who live in poverty on our streets or alone. May each one know your love and care for them, and may our leaders be inspired by the kingdom values of justice, generosity, and care for those in need. Strengthen what is good within our community and help us to nurture it. Wherever there is need, send your aid and renew our commitment to one another so that in our everyday lives, we may bear one another's burdens and rejoice in one another's joys. Lord, in your mercy. Loving God, inspired by your word and by your love, your disciples preached the good news to all the peoples of the earth. We pray for your church around the world and here in Canada and for our own congregation too that we may sow the gospel joyfully and widely in all our words and actions. Strengthen us to follow you in our lives, that through the goodness of our actions, the thoughtfulness of our faith, and the quality of our life together, 
many people would come to know something of the joy of life with you. Lord, in your mercy. Gracious and faithful Father, thank you for being with us in every difficulty and in every challenging situation. Look with compassion, we pray, on all who suffer. Support with your love those who are ill with chronic pain or debilitating illness, those denied dignity and who live without hope, those who are homeless or abandoned by society. Sustain those among us who need your healing touch for hurting minds and bodies, those who are sick and those who mourn. In this moment of silent prayer, Lord, we name those whose circumstances weigh most heavily upon us in our hearts. May they know the peace and comfort of your supportive care. You are always present with us, Lord. Help us to follow your example and be present with them. Lord, in your mercy. Holy and sovereign God, we thank you for the gift of life in the Spirit in Jesus' church. Grant us anew your grace that we may love you as you love us, without selfishness, without other motives, and without any desire for gain so that our worship may be pure, our prayers honest, and our lives upright in your sight through Jesus Christ our Lord. Gathering our prayers and praises into one, we pray together now as Jesus taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Our closing hymn this morning is Christ is the King, number 612. We are singing the first verse and then skipping ahead through verses 4 to 7.
I invite you to join me in our words of sending, which are on the screen. Go out into the world trusting with your hearts God's wisdom from above. Be in this world a sign of Jesus' presence. The peace of God which passes all understanding. Keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. And may the blessing of God, Creator, Christ, and Spirit be upon you and those whom you pray for today and always. Amen. Thank you.